to our NAGT webinar. The webinar or the NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education, research and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people just like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage everyone to invite your colleagues and attend and join our discussion. On the screen is a link to the webinar series where you can find the webinar schedule and archive of past events and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can find the slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. And these links are also in our chat. Before we get started, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on your screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and your cameras off. If you have questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box and webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation. A reminder that all participants of NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT Code of Conduct Policy linked in the chat for any details. Today's webinar is titled Graduate Student Onboarding Courses, Exposing the Hidden Curriculum to Help Your Students Succeed, presented by Karen Biskovich um, from Boise State University, uh, Michelle Cook from UMass Amherst, and Nathan and Nathan Yemi and Naomi Levin, both from the University of Michigan. They're going to talk about um, the value of graduate student onboarding and explore some potential topics for inclusion um, of those topics into courses. Thank you all so much for participating in the NAGT webinar series. You guys can go ahead and take it away. Um, thanks Bradley. Um, let me just share my screen. And Michelle, does that look right? And I have to turn on captioning. Okay, I think looks good Michelle. Yep, okay. So, uh, so, hi, I'm Michelle Cook, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm excited to introduce this one-hour webinar on graduate onboarding courses that expose the hidden curriculum of graduate school. After my introduction, you'll hear from Naomi Levin, and then Karen Viskupic, and then Nathan Nimi. After Karen's or excuse me, under Karen's leadership, the four of us have put together this webinar, but we need to acknowledge that this is part of a conversation that has been ongoing since last summer with Christopher Bell, Maya Breitbart, Emily Cooperdock, who will also be helping with the breakout rooms today, Anita Marshall, and Leanne Stevens. So over the past few years, I've had a few conversations with folks about first year graduate courses, but generally we've been working in isolation and serving our individual graduate programs. Then last summer, Anita Marshall tweeted about wanting to set up a course. And the response to that tweet revealed to me that we would all greatly benefit from talking to one another and sharing ideas about the ways that we teach the hidden curriculum of grad school. Over the summer and fall, this group listed on this slide, shared syllabi and activities and presented on the value of first year graduate courses at the GSA meeting. What we found over the summer and throughout the fall is that by sharing notes, strategies and challenges, we were actually back, back. Um, we were able to support each other as we were in the thick of teaching these courses. Our conversations also helped us to fine tune the goals and potential impact of our courses. This collaboration, especially during the pandemic, has been incredibly valuable and empowering. You can see from the collage of logos that we represent a wide range of institutions and different types of graduate programs, but we all have the same goal of trying to increase the equity and inclusion of our program and increase graduate student success. With this webinar, we invite you all to join our conversation. All right, next slide. From the pre-registration information that you all filled out, we learned that many of you are already teaching courses like this. Many of you are developing courses and some of you are interested in having a course that exposes the hidden curriculum. So this information from you helped frame our webinar goals. Goal one, promote value of graduate student onboarding courses for developing successful students and programs that are equitable and inclusive. The fact that you signed up for this webinar and are taking time out of your busy day tells us that you already appreciate the value of these courses. Not everyone sees this value and you may need to convince your colleagues. 
So we're gonna take some time in this webinar to outline the value of these courses in order to help you make those arguments for adding or augmenting existing onboarding courses in your curriculum. Goal two, share examples of course goals, content, activities, and logistics that have worked for our group who've been sharing notes since last summer. Goal three, we'll provide you with opportunities to, for you all to share your ideas, your strategies for strengthening your courses and what you need to, to, to get started developing first year graduate courses. And then finally, goal five, we'd like to strategize how to develop a community of faculty who are developing and teaching onboarding courses for graduate students. Well, let's explore ways that we can support our efforts and continue to learn from one another going forward. Next slide. With those four goals in mind, we have four parts of this webinar. Very shortly, Naomi is gonna outline arguments for why we need these onboarding courses. Karen and Nathan are gonna outline some example goals and activities, and then we'll go into breakout rooms to learn your ideas. We're hoping to keep parts one and two short so that we can spend about 10 to 15 minutes in the breakout rooms. And then for part four, we'll come back together and strategize ways to share our curriculum and activities. And Karen will also outline some possible next steps for growing this community. All right, with that, take it away, Naomi. Hi, thanks, Michelle. I'm Naomi Levin from the University of Michigan. I use she, her pronouns. Um, there are many reasons why you might wanna run an onboarding course like this. And so for students, the, the goals can really be quite broad um, and they can, but on a fundamental level, really basic, they can help students start to build the myriad of skills that they're gonna need to be successful in graduate school. And these are also skills that our students and people <laughs> need and can use later in their professional careers, whether they're in academia or not. So two, they also can learn a lot of the tacit knowledge of the discipline. Um, and these are the kinds of things that right, aren't written down um, that can be key to success. But there, when things aren't written down, as many of us know, um, it makes them unequal. The, 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 the access to that information isn't necessarily equal. And different people have, based on their experiences, they might have different channels to that information. So in many ways, this levels that, um, that access to information. The courses can also help students develop a sense of belonging in their department and their dis discipline. They are a very active, deliberate way of a program to tell their students that we care about you and we care about your success and we're invested in it. Um, and that sense of belonging is important and it can be particularly important for uh, minoritized, minoritized students who don't necessarily feel like they've had that endorsement in the past or they need it, um, they need it to be explicitly mentioned. Um, and that can be really important. And fourth, these courses can help students develop a cohort um, and a community which can help with success as peer networks can be really important. I also want to encourage you to uh, check out, yeah, so Michelle has put, she's beaten me to it. I had it all queued up <laughs> to put the link in the chat. It's great of uh, to this image. And I, it's going to, it's hard to see on in the webinar slide. So I encourage you, everybody's probably has a bajillion different windows open on their browsers anyway. So open a new one and click on this link to, <clears throat> to look at the image because this uh, artwork by Mackenzie Kerr from the University of South Florida is really great. And there's a lot of different ways that when we've been thinking about how to articulate the value of this course, she's really put it into a graphical form. Okay, uh, so next slide. I also wanna make the case that this of, and help you all understand and how to articulate, how do you make the case for these courses for programs as well, um, which is sometimes really important when articulating to your colleagues why you might need to run a course. So firstly, they can satisfy institutional requirements. So Nathan Neamey at University of Michigan, that's, he'll talk about he runs a research ethics course, which all of our graduate students and our postdocs have to take, and that satisfies an NSF research ethics requirement um, so that we sort of get it all done in that one way. And then this time that students spend thinking about research ethics, they can do it in a way that's applicable to our discipline. Um, it also can increase success for external grants. Um, and so uh, Maya Breivart at the University of South Florida has these great examples of the work that she's put in with her students and their return rates. So over an eight year period, 35% um, of um, all of the GRF uh, P sort of rewards that have been gotten by USF students have been gotten due to this um, as a function of her work with these students working with these um, 
of working with students to do this kind of grant preparation. Uh, we also do this at the University of Michigan. We haven't been documenting it to that the same degree, but we also help them have them write proposals that they then peer review and then they've gotten been successful in uh, raising external grants, um, whether it's from NASA or GSA or any, uh, there's a variety of different kind of grant access that your students could, um, could gain more access to by just getting this kind of practice. Um, these programs can also help reduce attrition. At the University of Michigan, we've uh, had to sort of bulk up our program in response to an internal review um, that wanted us to provide more internal support to our students. And we've actually seen that our retention rates have increased um, since, running, since running this course. So it can have a real numbers game, a real numbers impact. Um, and importantly, these courses can help do the work towards um, inclusivity and equity among our students and in our programs, which is really needs to be a mission of all of our programs. So this is very, while it's student centric, it really is also program centric in that way. Um, and as we know, there is a huge need in our disciplines and um, across in terms of departments that this increasing inclusivity is something that we need to prioritize. So moving to the next slide along those lines, I don't need to tell this group probably about the, um, the problem with diversity that we have in our discipline in terms of PhD awardees, um, but then also in terms of bachelor awardees and master's degrees awardees. So while we have a lot of work to do um, to increase the diversity of our applicants and of our students, we also need to change our programs to make sure that the students who are, do come into our doors and our programs are successful while they're, while they're here. Um, and that means making sure they have the support and changing maybe what that support might look like. So to do this, I think we need to recognize as departments and programs that we need to change how we do business. Um, and we need to change how we operate in many ways to make sure that we are more inclusive for our graduate students. So if we want things to change, we're gonna need to do things differently. Um, and it's not just about recruiting, it's really about how we operate. So. It's hard work, it takes time, it can sometimes feel slow, but through this group, and I feel like through maybe the collective community that's here that we represent, we can show that it's possible and it can be done in many small ways. And there's many ways to start. Um, so I'll pass it on to Karen next. Thanks, Naomi. I'm Karen Biskupic, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm gonna get us started talking about some examples of what this might look like. And so um, these, this slide shows a list of common topics in onboarding courses and the ones with um, either two asterisks are um, topics that many of you teach. Uh, those of you who filled out the, the registration survey and told us the types of things you're teaching in your courses. And um, so that's the majority of you are, are teaching that. And then um, topics with one asterisk are, are topics that many of you are teaching in your courses. So we've divided these into things that are related to logistics, um, skills for success, and then personal and professional development. Um, and in the next several slides, what we wanted to do was take the, have the four presenters, um, we kind of collected ideas from all of the courses that we teach to share with you. But I want to emphasize that um, none of us are doing all of these things in a single course, that in many ways these courses are, um, I guess you'd call them modular in that you can take any variety of these things and I think put them together into a course that has value uh, for students and for your program. Um, and also that uh, I think the content is also flexible and can be responsive to the needs of a student in any given cohort um, in any given year or semester. So we will talk more about some of these, these um, topics in detail in the next few slides and then also in the breakout discussions. Um, so this is just an overview of the four courses that the work that the webinar presenters teach. Um, and what you'll notice about uh, all four of them is that they're required. <laughs> so these are courses that students have to take. So if we want them to make a difference, we need to make sure that all students have access to the information and the experiences that we're providing in the courses. So um, if the course isn't required and it's an elective, um, you're going to miss some students. And whether those are students who 
don't feel they need the content or students who have advisors who are not supportive of um, this type of teaching. Either way, that's uh, right. Pe people lose out. Um, so having the courses be required is important. Um, and then also that they are taught uh, regularly and students take them in their first or second semester as a graduate student. Okay. Um, so in the next few slides, we are going to go through some examples of um, what course outcomes might look like for some of these different um, topics that are common in onboarding courses. So this first slide shows examples of outcomes that are related to resources. So um, those could be kind of resources and logistics. So understanding what the program requirements are, making sure that students know um, what kind of support structures and resources are available to them, either within your department or on your campus. Um, and making sure that students know where to go when they need help, that there is help available to them. Um, and, and that could be related to lots of things, whether that's help related to um, mental health or a writing center on campus, um, computing resources, right, all, all of these things. Um, so all of these slides will be structured the same way where there are outcomes on the, on the left and then some examples of course activities that come from the, the four courses that we represent. Um, and some of those course activities you'll have a chance to talk more about in the breakout rooms. I think for now we want to focus on um, just thinking about what these outcomes might look like for these types of courses. Okay, so resources. Um, communication was something that's, I, I think, almost universally taught or, or is, is part of um, these onboarding courses. So thinking about research proposal development, communicating your research to different types of audiences, um, creating effective figures, um, how, to, how to use the scientific literature to provide a context for what you're doing. Um, those are all outcomes related to communication. Uh, and then I think Nathan, you're gonna take over here. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Nathan Neme from the University of Michigan. Um, I have taught a research ethics course for the last 10 years uh, to graduate students and postdocs at the University of Michigan. Uh, and so some of the outcomes we have in terms of discussing research ethics, uh, we just study, discuss case studies of research misconduct. Uh, although there's a wide range of these things you often see on places like Retraction Watch um, or even in the New York Times, we focus on examples from the geosciences uh, and really bring home that this is happening in our own community and discuss what the uh, various types of uh, misconduct are, uh, how we might uh, intervene, um, why papers are retracted. Um, we work a lot on publication practices and ethics. Uh, this is really helpful for postdocs and graduate students. They're both always very interested. Uh, and particularly, I think, in the geosciences, uh, it, we're really uh, such a diverse field that we often have uh, faculty with backgrounds in chemistry, faculty with backgrounds in physics or biology or from the you know, geology and earth sciences. Uh, and these different fields often have very, very different conventions for they, how they deal with things like authorship, uh, publication, peer review practices. And it's really useful to discuss in our department uh, how even your colleague might be doing different things differently than you because of the practices that they have in their own field. Uh, we discuss intellectual property rights in a variety of ways. Many students publish code. Many people, uh, many students use others' code is an example that we come across a lot. Uh, but also understanding what is copyright, what is plagiarism. Um, these are things that the students will deal with as they go into the publication stage of their careers. Uh, but often as teaching assistants, plagiarism is something they'll end up dealing with with students they have in their own classes. Uh, and lastly, we talk about the role of scientists in society and geoethics and we use some case studies uh, from the earth sciences in particular. Uh, the Flint water crisis is, is home for us here in Michigan. Uh, we also study the history of the age of the earth and leaded gasoline uh, or the L'Aquila earthquake. Uh, and so we give this, uh, the students a role of, of how scientists might play uh, a bigger picture in society uh, beyond their own research. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also talk about professional uh, development outcomes uh, and so give the students agency uh, in terms of thinking about how to plan their own careers. Uh, how do they manage time? Uh, what do they want their graduate career to look like? Do they want to plan for an internship or taking time off along the way? Um, thinking about how to uh, uh, be responsible for themselves. And, and I think a lot of grad students find it a hard tr uh, transition, particularly if they're coming from an undergraduate school where they didn't have graduate student role models. Uh, to think about it's really being different from taking classes to, to, to planning things on your own. 
Um, how do you develop the skills and, and get the ones you want and need? How do you ask for that help? And where do you go uh, to learn skills or things we try and, and teach them? And as Karen said, a lot of this is giving them information for where they can get these resources. We can't cover it all in the course of a one credit course, but we can give them a lot of information they go back to. Uh, and I can speak for myself that students in my class often return over the course of the next three or four years to say, hey, I'm having an issue with this or an issue with that. I remember you discussing it. Can you remind me where I can get help for some of that? Uh, how to start a conversation with your advisor about your plans uh, and expectations, uh, how you're going to set goals, uh, what the expectations are, how to reassess those regularly, what kind of mentorship plans you're going to need and devise. Uh, and lastly, identifying professional paths and career options. And we do this often through alumni career panels at Michigan, uh, interviewing alumni, uh, uh, having, we're now in the virtual world, so we're doing this online on Fridays, career panels of graduates in a whole variety of different fields, discussing what those fields are like for our students, to give them some idea of what they might be looking forward to, uh, and helping them uh, plan professional preparation through uh, CV preparation and resume development. Uh, next slide. Uh, and lastly, we discuss what the expectations are for professional behavior uh, in, in the sciences and in our field, uh, how they can contribute to an equitable and collegial work environment, what expectations are in the office and in the lab. Uh, we often discuss laboratory and field safety. I found in the geosciences, one of the things we don't talk about a lot in, in kind of ethics fields is, is uh, biological and animal hazard uh, in personal studies, people studies, we don't do a lot of that. But uh, we have a lot of shared laboratories. We have a lot of students go to the field and they're both ethical and logistical uh, aspects of that that are worth discussing uh, because they can be so diverse in a geosciences department. Uh, we discuss the role of colonialism, how to deal with local communities. Uh, many of our students go to far flung parts of the world to do their research. Um, how should you prepare for that? How should you learn to travel there? Uh, how do you learn about local customs uh, and behave appropriately in a way that's acceptable uh, and appropriate to the environment you're in? Uh, and we discuss implicit bias uh, within the geosciences uh, through a variety of tools like taking the implicit bias test or uh, discussing gatekeeping in terms of decision making. Uh, next slide. So uh, we've covered five slides here with a variety of different kinds of general outcomes we might be looking for in terms of behavior, ethics, uh, logistics, um, and we're going to take some breakout rooms here to give everybody a chance to contribute some ideas they have or maybe bring up some questions they've had or challenges they've had in trying to uh, teach these things or get courses started. Uh, we're just going to have five breakout rooms open up with these topics you see here uh, on the left. We'll have uh, science communication and grant writing, uh, research ethics and geoethics, uh, professional development, mental well-being, work and life balance, uh, professional behavior, harassment, bias, and JEDI efforts, and student advisor relationships and conflict management. You're welcome to join any one of these groups, uh, and we'll try and take about 10 minutes or 15 minutes for each group to brainstorm some exercises that might work or discuss some uh, things they've tried to teach or would like to teach uh, or how to get a course uh, on these topics off the ground at their institution or experiences people have had in teaching these uh, with things that are effective for them. Uh, so hopefully if you uh, click on breakout rooms uh, down at the bottom, uh, you should see uh, a room, a set of rooms open up. Uh, and if you have not used it before, you should be able to click on the blue number to the right hand side of a topic. Uh, and it should take you to that, like, to that breakout room. So hopefully we'll see you guys in one of those shortly. Great. So I, I hope that that was enough time to um, be productive and get something accomplished. Maybe not everything accomplished. Um, there's probably more discussion to be had but um, at least I hope that that was a good start. So what we wanted to do now was to have each breakout group um, maybe share one of the key ideas or something new and exciting that you learned. Um, and we will make the notes from all of the breakout rooms available on the webinar website so that if you are interested in more than one breakout, group discussion, you can go and see what the other groups were, were talking about. Um, so does someone from the communication group want to start? Hi, I'll, I can just sort of report back that we sort of talked, I don't, we didn't focus too much on communication, but we just talked about a lot of how do you start a course like this? How do you, how do you run it? We talked a lot about the different specifically, you know, what would go into a hidden curriculum? Like what are the kinds of things that you would want that don't get discussed? So we talked about strategies about writing and how it's nonlinear, how you get the mentoring you need, time management, um, finding collaborators, uh, conflict resolution, um, other, so we sort of listed those kinds of things. And then we other topics that we talked about are 
how do we make a course like this accessible to master students in particular um, on a shorter timeline? And then also what are the kinds of the parts of the header curriculum that are really useful for students later on in their career that wouldn't get taught here and how do you basically continue that like how do you find a postdoc advisor that's certainly part of the hidden curriculum um, and there seems to our group there is only one other person who currently teaches a class and so there's definitely a lot of interest and need for a compilation of resources great thanks Naomi um, how about someone from the ethics group Yeah, I can summarize. Um, we had several people uh, in the group. Some are teaching uh, a semester or quarter long courses. Others, you know, do it in the course of a day. So it's uh, really quite a variety uh, in terms of how much time is taken to cover ethics. Uh, I think the one thing I took away from this conversation that's going to really make me think is, um, you know, I've thought a lot about training and preparing students to think about ethics through the course of graduate school. But of course, students leave graduate school and not all of them go on to academia. Um, and, and how do we uh, maybe modify or tailor the content uh, to be a bit more broadly applicable uh, to students who go on to careers that are outside of academia and, and provide them with things that are useful both while they're in graduate school but also prepare them for uh, what their careers might be like and what kind of ethical things they're going to encounter uh, in their careers beyond graduate school particularly outside of academia. Great thanks Nathan. Um, I was in the professional development uh, breakout room and we spent um, most of our time talking about time management skills and how to help students um, develop those skills and then use them in a way that helps them progress through their, their work um, at, a, at a good pace and thinking about how to help students to think about long-term goals and um, kind of the, the larger work that they need to be doing rather than prioritizing smaller smaller tasks that are easy to check off um, and, and kind of how some of those skills are related to students' um, sense of themselves as professionals. So helping students develop these skills that then um, make them feel like professionals. Um, I think that covers most of it. So how about someone, I forget who was in professional behavior, was that Emily? Yeah, um, I can summarize for our group. So um, along the list of topics, JEDI efforts uh, was one of them and that's what we really focused on. And um, we listed ideas of how to incorporate or discuss JEDI efforts. And I would summarize it as, you know, you could devote a class to reading the literature and kind of, you know, opening up the state of JEDI or diversity of our field and having a discussion-based class. Um, you could have a class that's focusing on how to incorporate, you know, kind of Jedi principles or professional behavior principles in terms of how you are developed as a research scientist or someone who does field work or lab work. Um, or you could use it as an opportunity to connect the students with existing resources that either exist on campus or through professional organizations um, to really act as a bridge for how they might get directly involved or find community um, beyond just the cohort. And you could do that um, right also by inviting experts who actually are trained in how to have these discussions to come have those discussions. And uh, just to make the point that, you know, often with these classes, you have maybe one class period, maybe two to really devote to a specific topic. So the point isn't to cover that whole topic, but to provide a gateway or introduction or expose it to the students to then um, look at it further later on. Great, thanks Emily. And then Michelle. Yeah, with the student advisor relationships or so occasional conflicts, it was uh, there was consensus in the group that these problems come up all the time and that they're really difficult to navigate when they come up because they're often in crisis mode. And um, some of the things we talked about are both empowering students to build their self-advocacy skills so that they can navigate those situations, but also working with advisors and figuring out uh, having them recognize the ways that they can be more effective in their mentorship and um, recognize helping them recognize the power structures that are at play there that they may not be aware of. And um, and so, so some of that happens in the classroom, some of that happens outside the classroom. And, and we all remarked on the pushback about that, that 
being told, telling our colleagues to change the way they do things is always really challenging and difficult. Certainly isn't going to be solved in just one uh, course, but can benefit maybe from us sharing our collective strategies. Awesome. Great. Um, any other key ideas that people want to share that maybe weren't provided in the summary? Okay, you can feel free to add things to the chat too, as we um, we have not a lot of time left to wrap things up. So, so um, I guess you know one of the key things that we wanted to accomplish with this webinar was to kind of broaden this community of people in the geosciences who are talking about onboarding courses and trying to share resources and to, um, I guess, try to make it clear to people who are developing or trying to develop a course like this or even try to insert some of these things into courses that they teach, that, that there is a community of people who are willing to share ideas and resources. And so one of the things that we would like to figure out is um, how to proceed and what would be most beneficial to the community in moving forward. So thinking about, um, you know, sharing syllabi, sharing course activities, sharing assessments, um, maybe developing a listserv where people can communicate and share ideas. Um, if, you, if you need to make a case for wanting to teach a course like this in your program, um, could we develop a kind of set of slides um, that would help you to make that case um, and, and we've also been thinking about trying to put together a workshop um, sometime in the next year that would kind of get the community together where we could develop um, or mo modify or curate the resources that we do have so that they're, they're um, easy to access and easy to use by members of our community. So, so that's kind of where we're going. Um, and we added some questions to the uh, post-webinar evaluation survey that you will all, uh, I think Bradley will send that to all of you. And it would be really helpful to us if you could complete that survey. Um, we added a few questions to that uh, about kind of steps moving forward and, and what would be most beneficial to you. Um, I think that's it. So we have you know four minutes <laughs> where we might answer some additional questions or, or talk about anything that we forgot to say along the way, important points that we wanted to make but forgot to make. So, so I'll just open it up. I'll just say that if anybody has other ways of potentially proceeding that Karen hasn't mentioned, like please raise them. I know that we have this community of people working on and we shouldn't be working in isolation. So. These are ideas that we came up with, but if anybody has any other ideas for next steps, like hopefully we can be a, a way to rally behind them. We, we think these that are useful. And I think Naomi said earlier on that, that this community has been really valuable for us, you know, personally and professionally to, like I've been teaching a course like this for, I don't know, a long, long time. And, <laughs> And it's really great to see that other people value it. You know, not that people in my own department didn't, but to know that there are um, others out there doing similar things and that, that they're important um, has been really helpful to me. Um. I think one thing in our group, we had a, a really diverse mix in terms of who was already teaching a course or was thinking that, you know, would like to teach a course or even folks who weren't in, you know, departments to teach it, but are in other areas of geosciences. And so how to incorporate, you know, beyond thinking just in terms of our departments and our universities, like resources available from professional societies, et cetera. And then I could see one, you know, outcome that maybe people would like is also some document to help, like what Naomi presented in the beginning about how to make a case for creating these courses. And that's something that we need to work on. And we can, if anybody else has data on this, but we need to work up our data in terms of GRFP success and other kinds of success to actually not just have just those stories, but then to support so that you people can come to their departments and say, these are what's being done and these are the outcomes. Um, so help make the case. Did 
there's a couple of good comments in chat, and I'm just reading one from Alan at saying that positive student evaluation might be helpful for making a case, and that's a great idea. And those of us who've been teaching might be able to solicit some uh, ways that these courses have helped students who are freshly out of it, as well as I'm really interested in longitudinally, you know, the students in their third and fourth year, do they feel that they are, they they benefited from some of that those discussions a few years ago. Probably a harder question to answer, but I would like to ask that of my own students. Okay, great. I don't want to go over time. So um, I think the, the real final thought is just to say thank you to all of you for participating in the discussion and sharing your ideas. Um, and kind of growing this community of, of people who can, I, I think, really make a difference um, for our community moving forward. So thank you.